welcome everyone and good evening and thanks for joining us um, this afternoon, even though the weather is good and the pubs are open, we really appreciate it. Um, we were already fearing that it was just going to be the two of us having a little talk. Um, but yeah, so welcome everyone um, and uh, welcome Caroline. Thanks a lot for uh, offering to give this talk today. Okay, so uh, with that said, I'm just going to hand over to Caroline. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining this. Um, this is a, a seminar that I'm um, often giving to Exeter University students, which is why Steve's name appears in that. Um, he's not here tonight. So Slow Food is an organization that I came across uh, back in 2006. They have an, uh, 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 an event called Terra Madre where they join everybody together from around the world and they just get small scale artisanal producers of things to feel comfortable in a surrounding where they can discuss ideas and talk about the problems that they have and all the rest of it. It's a sort of David and Goliath style event really. And Carlo Petrini is the founder of Slow Food. And he says, anyone who thinks of themselves as a food lover, but doesn't have any environmental awareness is naive. Whereas an ecologist who doesn't enjoy the pleasures of food certainly has a sadder life. And that meant so much to me. Uh, it really rang true to the way I, I felt about food and I felt about the planet at the time. Um, and it has been a bit of a journey. I, I, I first saw this slide in the late 90s. Um, and this is an example of the biomass of fish. And it says at the bottom there from the 1900s. So a long time ago, over a century ago, anything colored in red is where there was a high density of biomass of fish. And you can kind of see that fish like to live around the coastal areas that in humans often inhabit at, and then inhabit, sorry. And then in the, in the open oceans, you've got a much lower density of fish. Um, so you might have the migrating ones, but you certainly don't have the, the coastal density there. So that was 1900. And then it moves on to 1999, so a century on, and the red's just completely gone. Um, and there are a few patches of, of blue around. Um, and that that was just a real a shock to see some time ago now, at least 20 odd years ago when I first saw that. So I started looking into things. And um, this is, a again, little snapshots of sort of anecdotal stuff, I suppose, going on around the world. And the first one there is the 1950s the one on the top left there. And it's an American championship of, of amateur fishers. In the 1950s, the average catch was 44 pounds. In the 1980s, the average weight of the catch was 20 pounds. And in 2007, the average weight of the catch was just five pounds. So you can see just from very anecdotal evidence that, that it was easier to catch large, big species. They were plentiful and bountiful back in the 50s compared to just a couple of decades back, 2007, when it's gone down to as low as five pounds. Um, and much of this is to do with the fact that we've just got so good at catching fish. So from the 1950s onwards, um, we have invested hugely in, in um, bigger trawling capacity, boats with much more technological adv advances. So instead of having to skirt around delicate rocks and coral for fear of breaking nets, they now have sonar that are so accurate, they can go within millimeters of the rocks. Um, and so that leaves virtually no areas for the fish to hide. And these are actually taken from, the, these slides are actually taken from satellites so you can see there the Chinese trawler fleet in the Yangtze. From, from space, you can see the seabed scars that it leaves. It's really quite extraordinary. And the bottom right one there might look just very, very dark, but essentially there's nothing on it. It almost looks like sand dunes. And that should have been something more akin to a coral, coral reef. So we've just got really good at catching fish. Um, and the top one on the left there, this mega boat, 144 meters, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a European flagged boat. So again, there's a sort of sense that um, 
it's nothing to do with us, it's a foreign problem. It really absolutely is to do with us and it's not a foreign problem, but we are pushing our problems onto many other nations across the globe. So this one is a particularly large boat, 144 meters. It fishes there on the, on the left there on the bottom thing. You can see it's fishing off Mauritanian coast and it's fishing for Sardinella, which are little tiny, right at the bottom of the, of the trophic level um, fish. And they're fishing them essentially uh, to feed into uh, fish meal for largely developed world's um, uh, salmon farms. Um, so they're not even going into direct human consumption, they're going into uh, fish, fish meal to then be fed on to, to uh, farm salmon. And you can see that the size of these things, I'm sorry I'm so bad at, at PowerPoint here, it's just so laboring the point, but you can see how huge they are. Um, these, building, these boats are just massive, the capacity to catch fish is just colossal. Um, and the purse sailors, as it showed there, they could fit a couple of Vaticans in them. So the bottom trawl is the mouth of these, 363 metres, and what this boat there in one month will catch um, 7,000, the equivalent of 7,000 artisanal local fishermen. Um, and of course, before we even get to the social impact of that, there's a, of course the, the, uh, the, the environmental one as well, but the but the impact on the social side is, of, of course, colossal too. And it was really through Slow Fish that was really brought this home to me. So in 2004, when I first, was it four or six, when I first met the Mauritanian fisherwomen, they were telling us about what they do out of, on the west coast of Africa, of North Africa there. And it's a subsistence fishery. Um, they, they fish just for three months a year. They're fishing on grey mullet. So the men folk go out in, in small pirogue boats, tiny little sort of five meter boats. They'll go out in these fairly close to the shore. They'll catch gray mullet, let, land it back to the women on the, on the shore. The women fish and gut it. They put the, well, obviously they feed themselves. So it's a complete subsistence um, economy in the, on the local coast there. They also put things into dried form that they then sell into the interior. So they can sell that for the entire year. And then the real prize is the bit that they can get the more, most money for is the bottaga, which is the row of the egg, and that goes to a prize market in Italy. So this small three-month fishery keeps the entire Mauritanian coast going for the best part, well, for the entire year. And these guys were there telling us about this sustainable fishery, how they've been doing it for years. And two years later, just two years later, they came back to the slow fish event and they said, um, yeah, it's changing now. There's, there's big sites, uh, changes going on in the quota apparently because we've got these big European vessels coming close to our shores. They're going to sign deals to fish all our bottom fish. So these sardinella and that hadn't happened yet but the following two years it had started happening and the smaller boats were trying to go out and fish and not only was it incredibly dangerous to go out and fish because these large vessels didn't see them and they were just scooping them up in their nets, um, endangering the lives of these fishermen. But even when they did go out to fish, of course, there were just no fish left there to fish. So eight years on, the next two years, these guys were out there working on the boats of these big industrial trawlers at, at a pittance money, um, you know, close to the slave slave labor that we've learned about in sea spiracy um, and they weren't allowed to land any of their catch to the local markets and their women folk back on the shore so not only were they only earning a, an appittance of a living compared to before but the people on the on the on the shore weren't able to do anything in terms of processing and making a living for themselves there either and 10 years on from the start of all this the real tragedy was that the women were saying, well, they're not even with us any longer. They've all gone on to Libya. They're trying to get on boats and they're trying to migrate to, to Sicily and to Europe because there's no future here for them now. So our eternal demand for trophic level, low value fish to be fed to these wealthy um, farms in, in Northern hemisphere, Europe and America is really driving this whole economic migration um, and the uh, imbalance and the unfairness in the whole system. Um, 
So that one little fishery brought so many parts of this chain home to me. So it all really started here. If you look at the bottom there, it's the timeline. It really started getting bad for the fish in the 1950s where we really moved from steam to motor. And that's when our fishing effort just went through the roof. So you can see it's trudging along there, not much influence in that. And it goes really, really strongly upwards in the 50s. Um, and then on the other side there, the other charts to the right, you're seeing the landings per unit of power. So the landings had been fairly static and to be they've been going up a little bit as we got better got better at, at catching fish once the motored vehicles came in there in into play but thereafter we kind of reached a plateau actually incredibly early on i mean this is the 50s and 60s where per liter of fuel and effort used already we were seeing a decline And this one I think is really there to, 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 to demonstrate that if we stop fishing, it's not completely a disaster. Fish stocks can recover. Nature has an extraordinary ability to recover, although there are plenty of incidents in the world. Newfoundland with the cod fishery springs to mind where that's not happened. But if you can see here, these are the, the, the landings um, reported in, in tons on the left there. And on the bottom here is the, is the timeline starting from 1900. This is the, the First World War. This is the Second World War, and then going on to the present. And you can see we stopped fishing during the World Wars. Clearly, it was simply too dangerous to be out there. And as soon as we stopped fishing, actually, the, the landings bounced right back. So even within the relatively short periods of the war, two to three years where we weren't fishing, the stocks had the ability to bounce back really quite quickly. Um, and that's that's hugely encouraging if we give nature a chance. Daniel Pauley, who is the author of this report, um, is a professor of marine biology in uh, British Columbia University. And he is really um, a proponent for setting aside the, the sense, and I think he was leading the discussions of the criticism of the movie of Sea Spiracy not to say that any of it was wrong, but to say that it wasn't presenting a full picture, that there is a big difference between large and small scale. And he's put together these figures globally. So this isn't British figures, this is a global picture of, of fisheries. Um, and it was something that I was struggling to say for years and years. And then 2017, he came out with this one page diagram, the brilliance of this man's ability to portray very difficult subjects on just one sheet of paper. So large scale, he looked at the annual landings for human consumption, about 60 million tons are landed by the large scale boats, um, about half that 27 million landed by the small boats. Um, and this for me is already an interesting start because people will say to me, well, Caroline, you're living in cloud cuckoo land, believing that small scale boats can supply to the demands that are required by global consumption. Um, actually, they're doing already pretty well. Of this 60 million, the annual catch that's discarded at sea by the large boats is about 10 million, 10 million. So a significant proportion of what they of what they catch. There's almost no discards from the smaller boats. They really just don't discard stuff. And then you're looking at the annual catch that's come from the big boats for, that goes not to direct human consumption, but into uh, fish meal or bio biodiesel fuel, that kind of stuff. About 50% of what they catch goes into this, this form. Whereas again, with a small scale, virtually nothing. So if you took from the 60 million, the discards and the um, stuff that goes into to bio, biodiesel fuel or fish meal, Actually, it is the very small scale fishermen that are supplying the vast majority of, or, or equal um, uh, amount of, of consumption of, of fish consumed directly by humans. Um, so I, I really felt vindicated by this, that, you know, it's not that the small scale guys can't supply to the market. It's just that there are so many obstacles in the way for them to do it easily. Um, and it's not in the interest of the large scale to notify customers, oh, this is from an industrial trawler and this is from small, because given half a chance, I'm sure most of us would switch to a local fishery. So then you're looking at things of the climate change. Um, you know, you, you kind of assume that 
if you were catching with a bigger boat, there would be some kind of um, economies of scale when it came to fuel consumption. But even there, the larger boats are consuming more fuel per ton of fish landed than the smaller boats, which came as quite a surprise to me. And again, goes to show how important it is to, to differentiate small from large. You have the social aspect. So we've always looked, already looked at the stuff from Mauritania where hundreds of small scale artisanal boats were displaced by just that one um, European flagship. But the, the fisher, fishermen employed in the large scale boats is about half a million, it's about 12 million, million in the small scale. So the social benefits there are much more, um, much more felt in coastal communities from the small guys over the large. And then I think Daniel Crawley has always been one to say, governments, you need to stop subsidizing these uneconomical, un, uh, climate change friendly and damaging fisheries. If you stop the subsidies, perhaps that would help move the boundaries along towards people being able to access more smaller scale caught fish. So the small boats don't take money from the taxpayer either. What's not to like about small scale, hey? And so the fishermen say to me, well, Caroline, I don't know why you're worrying about the environment. You know, there may be less fish in the sea, but it's, it, there are less of us as well. The small scale guys are, are, are going by the wayside. And sure enough, if you look back to 1995, you can see that the number of fishermen in the UK was about 20,000. It's dropped now to, to closer to about five and a half in England. So in just 20, 30 odd years, we're seeing a precipitous decline in the number of fishermen that are even trying to make a living now out of, out of fish. So why was solar discretion needed? Um, so I'm a fishmonger based in Plymouth. Um, and I think the, the reason we really started was, I, I, I worked in restaurants before, I set up a, a sushi bar in London. It was the first conveyor belt um, sushi restaurant in Britain. And to my shame, perhaps in 1994, I had no inkling of of fish docks and I didn't link what was on the menu to the plights of the sea. And we were selling bluefin tuna and it came to the summer of 1997. And I remember going into the restaurant and saying to the chefs, guys, you know, call ourselves a Japanese restaurant. We don't even have bluefin tuna on the menu. And they said, yeah, 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 we did try and get some, but um, supplier just said there wasn't any around. And it didn't take long to kind of look through. And the supplier said, yeah, yeah, we're really trying hard for you, Caroline, but there's just none around. And this was before they'd started ranching bluefin tuna. So there was this kind of, they're now ranching it. It took about four years to get the, the lack of wild stocks um, managed so that they could start. I mean, there's a difference between farming and ranching that I'll go into if people are interested, but it's, it's now ranched, which is why the supply chain of it is, is a bit smoother. You don't see these big troughs up and down of, of bluefin tuna, but essentially, it was a light bulb moment for me when I remember getting in touch with WWF and they put me in touch with somebody um, in uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium called Carl Safina. And I remember phoning him from our fax machine um, just to give you the date of it and just saying, Carl, Carl, I've got a problem here. I'm, I'm running a Japanese restaurant in London. I really need some bluefin tuna. And apparently the Northern bluefin's just, just pretty much gone. Can you tell me where I can buy it from, please? And there was this long pregnant pause and this, this man, this lovely scientist said, now Caroline, you wouldn't put rhinoceros on your menu, would you? I was like, oh, okay, no, maybe I wouldn't Carl. So that was a bit of a light, light bulb moment for me. And I kind of saw then that actually, um, of course it wasn't just bluefin tuna, which was then identified as an, in, an endangered species, but the whole, I think 70% of stocks at that point were still, um, under, under threat, they were, they were being um, overfished or in danger of being overfished. So it put a complete different light on things. And, and then people like Jamie Oliver and Hugh Ferling Whittingstall really did well for the restaurants in, in enabling them to help change their supply chain. So I really felt that restaurants were kind of um, uh, able, better able than actually consumers going to a shop to get better fish. So I felt there was a real gap here. So on the one hand, my fishy friends were saying to me, um, Caroline, where do I buy fish that you, you think is, is well caught? And on the other hand, I'm with a load of small scale fishermen saying, 
Well, we land to the market and when the big beamer trawl boats have landed, we get exactly the same price for our line caught fish as the big beam trawlers might do. Or we can only fish in small areas and we can only fish for a small number of days in the year because the weather is such that we can't go out so often. Or we only fish with, with large mesh sizes, for example. So we're trying to catch fish that are sexually mature and aren't in danger of, of, of leaving no fish left for tomorrow. So there's a complete disconnect. And I think it was out of frustration really that I felt that I needed to work exclusively with these small scale fishermen to be able to offer 100% under 10 meter boat fish to the consumers. Um, I still think we've got a long way to go and perhaps one of the questions will ask you this. We're, we're, we're looking at um, soil association as being um, a means of saying to, to consumers, we are doing a wild fishery certification of exclusively low impact small scale boats. Um, and they're very keen to work with us on that. And I think it's one thing me telling you and others, don't worry, it's me and my fishermen, we're all doing fine. Um, but it's quite another for companies, uh, retailers to feel confident that that's the case. So everybody is looking for uh, some kind of certainty, some kind of assur assurance that what we're saying is actually what we're doing. Um, and the Soil Association is perhaps one way of doing that. I'd be interested to hear your, the audience's opinion on that. Um, so that's what we do on every single pack we put the name of the species and the boat that it was caught by, but importantly, the method it was caught by. So we tell you if it was line caught, we tell you if it was trawled, we tell you if it was netted, we tell you if it was dived. Um, so you're able as a consumer to make a bit more of an informed choice as to what you want to see in your own fish baskets. Um, I was quite curious about the labeling of uh, ethical fisheries rather than just sustainable fisheries. So there's obviously a difference between those two and you decided to go for ethical and uh, rather than just labeling it sustainable. And uh, I have two questions about that really. So the first one relates around that term ethical. Um, what, what exactly does that encompass? Because I was thinking since it, for me, it would have to do a lot with the method of fishing as well, because I think some methods of fishing can never be ethical because the fish suffer such a lot. So for me, in an ethical method of fishing, that would, would be, for example, if you spear a fish, it's swimming around and you spear it and it doesn't know what hit it and it's dead. And it doesn't lie for minutes somewhere out of its element gasping for breath and, uh, and in fear uh, until, until it someone dies. So I think that that whole talk about the method is something um, and I suppose that's part of what it relates to as well, that, that ethical aspect of it. Um, yeah, it's interesting. So in the Soil Association project, there is a part on, on the, the fact that fish are sentient beings. Um, and I, I, I don't know any fish, except for the Japanese Ikejima, where they spike the, the brain, that really die a good life, um, die a good life, die a good way. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So the expensive fish will get uh, like a turbot will have its nail, uh, its tail notched and it'll bleed slowly to death to create the whiteness in the flesh. Um, a dogfish has got no swim bladder. It will be alive the next day sometimes. So it's just gasping for hours. Um, yeah, it's a really difficult question that's got, I, you know, if, if, if that's, if that's the main driver in your in your ethics then absolutely fish are you know eat meat don't eat fish so you basically uh, they, they live a great life but they die really badly yeah um yeah the, the, there's a scientist that say to me when i get all kind of like oh, is that you know no fish dies well it, it's usually been eaten by something in the sea that's got a bigger jaw than it but I would argue at least that's quicker. Yeah, I was just going to say, that's why I was thinking about the spare fishery, just sort of like you, you, you gulp down and then that's it. Yeah, um, yeah because that was my kind of uh, thinking about, because I get the ethical part if you kind of look at the human aspect of it. Sure. But if you look at the, uh, at the animal aspect of it, um, I would also agree that there's probably no real ethical fishery 
possible under that aspect. I yet I've yet to find one. There's a Billo in 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 Germany actually is working a lot on on this very subject. So I can put you in touch with that organization. But they're trying really hard to push that up the agenda. Mm -hmm. But it's just really hard, isn't it? You could yeah. electrocute them, but how do you electrocute fish without killing yourself on a boat? I mean, you know, <laughs> it's so hard. Yeah, uh, that's um, true. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Um, uh, great, great audience. I mean, really, I, I love the. I could just feel the vibe out there. You're all anarchists and you're all this change. <laughs> so power to you. Um.